medcram.com. Welcome to another MedCram COVID-19 update. Now, you may have heard that the FDA is limiting the use of certain monoclonal antibodies. We're going to talk about that today, which ones have been limited, and why are they doing this? And for those who don't know about monoclonal antibodies, I encourage you to look at our monoclonal antibody video, specifically with Omicron. So there are three monoclonal antibody products that have been given emergency use authorization in the United States. The first one is by Lilly, and it's banlanivimab combined with atesevimab. The second one is Regeneron product, which is casarivimab and imdevimab. And the final one is made by GSK, which is citrovimab. And all of these went phase three randomized placebo-controlled trials that showed that there was improvement and a reduction in the amount of hospitalizations and death when administered as outpatients with one or more risk factors for progression. You can see there that the ban lenivimab itisivimab product reduced the hospitalization mortality by 87% relative risk reduction. The Regeneron product, 71% relative risk reduction, and the GSK product, 85% relative risk reduction. And of course, all of these were tested well before Omicron, as you can see there by their EUA dates. And just for a quick review, the purpose of these monoclonal antibodies is when a virion is present with spike protein. Of course, that spike protein wants to interact with its receptor on the cell surface, which in this case is the ACE2 receptor. And of course, if that happens, then the contents of the virion will then be incorporated into the cell and you have an infection. What these antibodies are designed to do is to bind very nicely to the receptor binding domain of these spike proteins to prevent that from happening. If you can neutralize the spike protein, then the virus cannot infect the cell. Of course, these monoclonal antibody products are all slightly different. They all interact with the spike protein in a different way, and therefore they have different efficacies. But then the other part of it is is that these spike proteins itself can mutate and change, and depending on how they mutate and change, they can render one or all of these monoclonal antibodies less effective. So ideally, what you'd want to do is do a randomized controlled trial again with the new variant, But that's going to take a long time because remember, these endpoints here are hospitalization and death, and that can take weeks to get enough people enrolled to get that endpoint. And by the time you get that endpoint, it could very well be that the surge of that particular variant is over. And so one of the things that scientists have come up with to anticipate or to in vitro or in a test tube figure out whether or not these new variants will create escape from these monoclonal antibodies is by doing something called a pseudovirus model. And you can see here, this is what we have as a pseudovirus. The pseudovirus in this paper, which we'll show you, was actually a vesicular stomatitis virus, which is a very common pseudovirus to use. And they put a marker inside of the pseudovirus, and they're able to engineer on the surface the exact spike protein in the variant. So they can check the variant with the different spike proteins and then see whether or not the addition of antibodies, as you see here, will limit its ability to infect. The way they can tell whether or not it's infecting is whether or not the marker, in this case luciferase, is able to go inside of a membrane which has a lot of ACE2 expressed on the surface. And of course, they can vary the concentration of the antibody. So they can see whether or not a specific amount or concentration of antibody is better or worse at neutralizing or inhibiting the ability of the pseudovirus from infecting this overexpressed cell. So that's exactly what they did in this paper, which we're about to review. So this was a paper by Keo et al. It was submitted to Medical Archives, which has not been peer-reviewed or published as yet, on December 9, 2021. There have been many other papers very similar to this that have been published, at least two other independent labs in Germany, and also have been confirmed by the companies themselves who make these monoclonal antibodies. So let's take a look and see what they found. So what we have here is a graph, and we're going to see this over and over again. At the bottom of the y-axis is zero inhibition rate. This is where we have the least amount of antibody concentration and the pseudovirus is allowed to at will infect the cells. And then at the top, we have no infection. In other words, we have 100% inhibition and you can see that here at the top. So as you can see, as the increased antibody concentration goes up, as we increase the antibody concentration, we see that inhibition also goes up. 
And there's a particular level that we're looking at, and that's where we have 50% inhibition. And with each of these graphs, we'll have a concentration, and that's known as the IC50, or the half maximal inhibitory concentration. And simply what they're saying here is that this is the concentration where we can inhibit exactly half of the maximum. And so you can see here that we simply increase the dotted line, and we can see here that in this case, banlinivimab, which is made by Lilly, this monoclonal antibody did a better job of inhibiting the alpha variant than it did, in this case, the mutation known as D614G, which is one of the first mutations in the United States. And so the question is, is how did it do against Omicron? Now, you may not see the curve for Omicron. That's because Omicron is light blue, and unfortunately, it is down here. Yes, what this means is that even at very, very high concentrations of banlinivimab for Omicron, there really was no inhibition whatsoever. And so this shows pretty conclusively that banlinivimab, which is one of the components in the Lilly monoclonal antibody, is really ineffective against Omicron. Okay, let's look at the other component of the Lilly monoclonal antibody, which is etisethimab. And again, we're going to look at the 50% line here, which is the half maximal inhibitory concentration. And you can see here that for Delta, we actually had a pretty good efficacy here with this and slightly less with the D614G mutation and even worse for Alpha. But again, for Omicron, really no activity even at a concentration of 10 micrograms per milliliter, which is pretty high concentration. So once again, it looks as though for Omicron that both components of the Lilly product of monoclonal antibody is really ineffective. Okay, we're going to move on to the Regeneron product. There's two monoclonal antibodies at that one. One of them is Casarivimab. Again, let's look at our 50% line here, and you can see very good against Delta, a little bit less effective against the D614G mutation, Alpha even less, Gamma even less, and Beta way here. And then, of course, as we've seen before, Omicron, really no activity worthwhile to speak of. So the Casarivimab is not effective against Omicron. Let's look at the other component of Regeneron, which is Imdivimab. And once again, we draw our line here. We can see for all of these here, really not bad in terms of activity. But once again, Omicron, light blue, no activity. So that means that both monoclonal antibodies in the Regeneron product are pretty much without efficacy against Omicron. Finally, let's look at Citrovimab, which is the GSK product. Once again, we look at the 50% inhibition line, and we can see that all of the variants here are pretty much susceptible to the GSK product Citrovimab, including Omicron. We can see here that Citrovimab actually is pretty effective, just a slight decrement here in terms of the IC50. And so this is why the EUA has not been limited against citrovimab. Citrovimab still shows pretty good efficacy against even Omicron. So for those of you who like this in tabular form, we've got basically the different monoclonal antibodies here on the left. We have the different variants across the top. And what we're looking at here is, again, the IC50, or the maximum inhibitory concentration. Remember, we want a lower number in this case. A lower concentration means that it's more powerful. So things that are darkened in red are going to be pretty bad. In other words, anything greater than 10 is going to be pretty ineffective. And you can see for Omicron, which is the current variant, we can see that almost all of them are completely ineffective except for perhaps one AstraZeneca product that has not been given emergency use authorization in the United States. The only two that seem to do well is, of course, Citrovimab, which we see here as its original product number VIR7831. And of course, another product, which is DXP604, which is a bi-gene synglomics product in China. And so just to sum up where we were, as you can see, these two here make up the Lilly product. These two here are Regeneron. And this one here is Citrovimab. And you can see when we had Delta as the major variant, 
Lily actually had one active monoclonal antibody, and Regeneron had a couple of effective monoclonal antibodies, and Citrovimab did as well. But when we went from Delta to Omicron, you can see why these two products would not be very effective and why Citrovimab still would be. And so because of this, the FDA wrote a letter to both Regeneron and Eli Lilly and Company, and this is the letter that they wrote to Eli Lilly and Company, and you can see here what they say. They say, on January 24th, again, having concluded that revising this EUA is appropriate to protect the public health or safety under Section 564G2 of the Act, FDA is reissuing the December 22, 2021 letter in its entirety to further limit the use of banlanivimab and etesevimab administered together for treatment of COVID-19 or as post-exposure prophylaxis of COVID-19 to exclude geographic regions where, based on available information, including variant susceptibility to these drugs and regional variant frequency, infection or exposure is likely due to a variant that is non-susceptible to banlanivimab and etesevimab. Corresponding revisions have also been made to the authorized fact sheets. Now, one thing you have to understand is that variants are not detected at the patient level. They are grouped together at regional levels and random samples are taken and then they are fully sequenced to see which samples are which variant. And so that's how we know in terms of districts or areas of the country which variant is represented as the majority. And you can see here in this graph going from October all the way to the present here in late January that there has been a definite switch from Delta, which is in yellow, to purple, which is the Omicron variant. And as you can see here in terms of the United States, 99.9% of the current infections are Omicron. And as you can see here in terms of the number of cases in the United States, there's been a very precipitous rise here in November and December, and then it seems to be dropping very rapidly. There is a practical question as to whether or not the decision to limit the emergency use authorization of the Regeneron product and the Lilly product should be based on the pseudovirus benchtop experimentation or whether it should be based on randomized controlled trials. Remember that randomized controlled trials, especially if you're looking at an endpoint for hospitalization and death, are going to take weeks or even months. By that point, the wave of Omicron may in fact be gone, and we may be in hopefully not another wave, but there's also a potential of another variant. And so thus, if we depend on randomized controlled trials to determine whether or not we should give out an intervention that may be completely ineffective, we may be always a dollar short and a day late, so to speak. There's also the interesting aspect of entering patients into a study where informed consent would require us to say that we are giving you a intervention of a monoclonal antibody, which on the benchtop has been shown to be completely ineffective. I'm not sure how many patients would be willing to be subjects in that experiment. I'd also just like to add as well that the issues that we see here with antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 and the Omicron variants are really in total limited to monoclonal antibodies. While it is true that vaccination does increase antibodies against the virus, that's only one aspect of immunity that we see. Remember, there are also T cells and memory B cells as well. To date, vaccination has been very effective at preventing hospitalization. As we can see with this graph, as we go from left to right, the percentage of fully vaccinated in each state goes up. As we go from the bottom to the top, the number of confirmed COVID-19 hospitalizations per 100,000 residents go up. You can see the average in the United States is right here in terms of the average vaccination rate and the average confirmed COVID-19 hospitalization rate per 100,000 residents. And as you can see from this, every state with a higher hospitalization rate than the country overall has a lower vaccination rate, and that every state with a higher vaccination rate than the country overall has a lower hospitalization rate. Again, if we look at COVID-19 associated hospitalizations by vaccination status in adults ages 50 to 64 years of age, even going to the end of December where we had Omicron, 
we can see here in the orange bar those that are unvaccinated and the rate per 100,000 population. In the dark blue line, we see fully vaccinated without additional booster dose. And then below that, in light blue, we see the fully vaccinated with additional or booster dose. For those of you that would like to see it broken down a little bit better, in terms of ages, you can see here this is the age-adjusted rates of COVID-19 hospitalization by vaccination status in adults 18 or older from January to December of 2021. So this includes Omicron, and you can see here that per 100,000 population, we're looking at the rate here in blue of unvaccinated persons and in green, the rate of fully vaccinated people. For those aged 12 to 17, this time from June to December of 2021, including Omicron, as again, we can see in blue the rate in unvaccinated persons per 100,000 population and those in green in fully vaccinated persons. I think it's important to remember that vaccination is more than just antibodies against the virus to prevent infection. It also provides a substantial amount of protection in the T-cells and that translates into lower hospitalization rates. We'll put these studies in the description below. Thanks for joining us.